Hey everyone, welcome back and let's write some more neat code today. So today let's solve the problem maximum element after decreasing and rearranging. So we have a pretty fair problem today and that's good because I'm a bit rusty. We are given an array of positive integers and we can perform some or none operations on the array to satisfy a few conditions. Before we get into what conditions we need to satisfy, I like to look at the operations that are actually available to us. And that is we can rearrange the elements in any order. And we can also decrease the value of any element to be a smaller positive integer. We can actually perform these operations as many times as we want. After we are done, we just want to return whatever the maximum possible value in the array could be after performing these operations. Now, the catch is the conditions that the array has to satisfy. One of them is that the array has to start with a value of one. Second is that the absolute difference between any two adjacent numbers has to be at most one. So in this case, it is at most one for all of the adjacent pairs. Now, if I make a couple values equal, it's still true. Like the maximum absolute difference between these is less than or equal to one. And it has to be at most one. So that works. The very first thing you might think is, well, if the first element is one, and the values kind of have to be consecutive. Well, can we just take the length of the array and return that as like the max number? Because we're starting at one and we're gonna be kind of doing plus one each time. No, we can't do that. And this example kind of shows you why, because this is a valid array. And even the first example here shows you why, because here we are given these numbers and we can rearrange them in sorted order like this, one, one, two, two, two. Now it's perfectly valid. And we can't make the maximum number in this array any bigger because remember, we can't increase the value of a number. We can only decrease it. So in my opinion, this problem isn't super complicated. The hardest part about this problem is really making sure you understand all of the requirements that you don't miss anything. So with all of that in mind, it seems like sorting the array is definitely helpful because we know that the array must start with one. And if we sort the array, it'll be pretty straightforward for us to know if we have at least a one or maybe we have something greater than a one. We can't possibly have anything less than a one because the integers are positive. So don't make uh, make sure not to miss that. And obviously the fact that we want to arrange them in such a way that adjacent values have a difference of at most uh, less than or equal to one. And the best order to put the values in to ensure that would be in sorted order. So once we have that though, once we have the elements in sorted order, what do we do next? Well, let's just run through it without even thinking about the code. Let's just manually solve the problem. Okay, we start with a one, that's good. Because if this was greater than a one, suppose it was a two, we would have to decrease it down to a one. And it's not like we'd have to count that as an operation because we don't care how many operations we perform. We just want to basically get these values in an order that satisfies these conditions. So that's good so far. Now we have a two. Well, let's compare it with the previous guy. The difference is definitely less than or equal to one. So this is good so far. Now we have five here. Now we compare these two. The difference is definitely not less than or equal to one. So we have to change this number because we can't change this. We can't increase this. We have to decrease this. How much are we going to decrease it by? We actually have two choices, believe it or not. We can, if we want to, make it a two or we can make it a three. Both would be perfectly valid. But which one do you think is going to lead to a maximum possible value in the array? Probably the bigger one, right? So that's what we do. We make this a three. And now we're here. We compare seven, not with five. We compare it with three. And we check, is the difference between three and seven less than or equal to one? Nope, it's not. So now again, we have those two choices. We can make this a three or a four. And of course, we're going to make it four. So that's how you solve this problem with kind of just like manually by hand. Now, what's the pattern that you noticed in terms of code? Well, we only like every time we look at a value, we only need to keep track of what the previous value was. That's like the first thing to notice. And second is when we do decide to make this element smaller, we always set it. And actually, that's not super obvious yet. Let me change this example slightly to illustrate the second point. Let's make this a two and now a two. Now, what do we do? These two are good. Now, when we get here, 
What's the difference between these two? It is less than or equal to one. So we can't decrease this. There would be no reason to do that. And we can't increase it. We can't make it a three, unfortunately. So we leave them as is. And when we get here, we do the same thing. These two are equal. So that's fine. And now we're done. This was the largest value. The last value is pretty much always going to be the largest value. So now, what do you notice about what we're doing to this second one? Well, it's not super obvious, but we're always taking it and setting it to the minimum of the previous value plus one or the current value. Let's just call that array at index I. The reason we're doing this is because in cases of a tie, we would need it to be set to the value that it itself is. But in cases where this value is bigger, something like a seven, we're going to set it now equal to the previous value, which is two plus one. So then it would be a three. So that's where I'm getting this formula from. That is pretty much all we need to code this up now in terms of time complexity. Yes, we are doing a linear scan, but before we do that, we are sorting the array. So the time complexity is going to be big O of n log n. So now let's code it up. So first thing I'm going to do is just sort the array. And then we are going to start iterating over the array. So for n in the array, we are going to do that minimum formula. But we actually do not need to modify this array because remember how I said we only are keeping track of the previous element. So instead of actually modifying the array in place, I'm just going to keep track of the previous element. And by the time we finish the entire array, we can just return that previous element because, like I said, the last value in the array is going to be the return value. It's going to be the greatest in the array. So what should we initialize this to? Before I even do that, let's just write out the formula. Previous is equal to the minimum of previous plus one and the current value that we're at in this array. This is the formula, remember, but why are we assigning it to previous? Because we're taking the previous number because sort of in this context, this is the current number and we want to populate this for the next iteration of the loop. So that's why I'm assigning it to this variable. But this is kind of the tricky part because remember how they said the array has to start at one. So if it doesn't start at one, suppose it starts at two, we would want this formula to evaluate to one. So how can we do that? Well, think of it like this. We are given an array and to the left of that array, we're just kind of putting an implicit zero there. We're just assuming that there is a zero that comes before all of these values in sorted order. So that's why I'm going to set previous equal to zero because it will ensure that this zero plus one evaluates to one. So if this number is bigger, if it's a two, this will evaluate to one and then this will sort of be one as well. So that's pretty much the entire idea of this problem. That's the code. So now let's run it to make sure that it works. And as you can see, yes, it does. And it's pretty efficient. If you found this helpful, please like and subscribe. If you're preparing for coding interviews, check out neatcode.io. Got some cool features coming and a new course launching probably tomorrow. Thanks for watching and I'll see you soon.